Okay, well, welcome back, folks. We are into the study of the Ozarks, and we're not too far from being done with this. Uh, we've got this week, we're going to talk about tourism, the origins of the tourism industry in the Ozarks. And then next week, we're going to uh, talk about the Great Depression, which probably won't be that much history for a few of you. Uh, it wasn't me. I was born after the Great Depression, but I definitely felt the effects of it for my parents, who were definitely children of the Great Depression. And then we're going to finish up the uh, last week in February talking about an infamous uh, event that occurred in the Ozarks called the Young Brothers Massacre. Kind of ends the, the story of the Ozarks for us, because we're only going up through the Depression. But today we're going to talk about tourism. Now, we all know that tourism is a very big part of the Ozarks today, or at least if, if you're from this area, you know that. Um, it's the second biggest cash producing industry in the state of Missouri next to agriculture. And uh, that may surprise people because some people just don't realize that Missouri is such a big tourist state, but it really is. Uh, so how did this happen? How did tourism become so big in the Ozarks? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, kind of talk about how the events that took place. Uh, before the publication of The Shepherd of the Hills that we talked about last week, the novel, uh, tourism just did not exist in the Ozarks. Uh, in fact, the case nobody came to the Ozarks very often unless you wanted to live there. Uh, there had been some attempts to kind of make tourist areas out of it. A family called the Lynches had purchased Marble Cave, which later on becomes Marble Cave. A rich group of men from St. Louis had tried to create a game club out of eastern Taney County. But the point of it is that really up until the publication of Shepherd of the Hills, tourism just did not exist in the Ozarks. Of course, that's all going to change. And like I said, in the 20th century, we know that the Ozarks now is a huge tourist industry. And uh, folks, I've seen this balloon in my lifetime. Um, I'm 75 years old. I can remember very definitely when the 76th strip from downtown Branson to the Silver Dollar City was nothing more than a country road. Uh, it just did not, you know, the, the strip as we know it today, the country fried Las Vegas, uh, you know, it didn't it didn't exist, you know, in the 50s and the 40s and the 30s. Um, the roots of this neon jungle, though, go all the way back to the remote rugged hills and hollows when urban dwellers first discovered what was called Arcadia in the Ozarks. Now, this was a big deal in the late 19th century. Uh, the people in the cities were looking for an escape. The cities of the 19th century in America were pretty rough. Uh, they were polluted. We think they're polluted today, trust me. Nothing compared to what they were in the end of the 19th century. Uh, it was a, a not a very good life. Uh, people were squashed into tenement homes, and they were looking for an escape. And they began to look for something that became known as Arcadia. It was named after an old Greek uh, part of, of uh, you know, Greece that the Romans had discovered, known for its pastoral and rural simplicity. And so people began to look to try to find places to go and visit that could get them back to their roots, uh, get them back to the, the more rural life. This is a picture of 76 strip before it was 76 strip. Uh, you can see it's probably in the 20s and 30s because you've got automobiles lined up down here. But here's a wagon being pulled up what later on becomes Highway 76. There's the bridge that crosses over Lake Taney Como. Um, that's uh, Presbyterian Hill up here. Uh, this, you know, this is this is what it looked like. So let's go back to the beginning. The Lynches. Uh, Marble Cave had existed for a long, long time. If you don't know that much about Marble Cave or Marvel Cave as it's known now, uh, it's really nothing more than a big sinkhole that leads into a cavern. Uh, I trust a lot of you have probably been in the Marble Cave. 
And it was the first curiosity. People that came here, that was something that they were just amazed at. Um, they really didn't realize how big it was for a long time because no one would, could get down in there. Uh, as it turned out, the opening to the cave, once you get down in it, the cavern itself, the first big room, is big enough to hold the Statue of Liberty. That's how big that thing is. It's huge. Uh, and it was, of course, you know, dangerous. Now, the first people that explored this cave thought that there was marble in it, which what they saw was limestone, but they thought it was marble. And so they, find, they formed a consortium of investors, uh, one of which was a man by the name of Truman Powell. You might remember him from last week. He was the man that kind of served as the model for the shepherd. When Harold Bell Rock wrote The Shepherd of the Hills, Truman Powell was a man that lived in Mutton Hollow area. And he kind of served as the model for the shepherd for uh, Harold Bell Wright. Well, Truman Powell was also one of the investors in trying to mine marble. Well, they figured out really fast that this wasn't really marble and it really wasn't worth anything to mine out. But what they did find was bat poop. Now, <laughs> you might laugh and they want <laughs> Why would they want to mine bat poop? Well, it's called guano, by the way. Well, th the bottom line is, folks, great fertilizer. And there was a, you know, it was a fantastic fertilizer. Say so they began to haul out the bat manure. And trust me, that was not an easy effort to, mi to, to mine it. Uh, of course, you might also realize you probably figured out real fast. It didn't take long to get rid of all of it. You know, it was not an inexhaustible supply. And as a result was that soon turned into nothing so basically the pal the um, cave was just sitting there for a long time uh there were people that came there and they would explore it principally led by truman powell he was the man that kind of did most of the early exploration but by 1894 um a man by the name of lynch and his two daughters miriam and genevieve they decided to purchased a cave uh, and turned it into a tourist thing. Now, I have no idea what was in their mind because you couldn't hardly get the Mutton Hollow from anywhere. I mean, to get the Mutton Hollow from Springfield in the 1890s was a two-day journey down some of the most treacherous winding roads in Missouri. And I don't know why he thought that there would be a, a you know, tourist attraction there but he opened it up he built a big tall ladder uh he even got a piano down there and his daughters would sit there and play and sing the piano for people that would come visit the cave which weren't very many as it turned out of course as you might imagine it was a complete and utter failure it didn't work at all there's mr lynch and there's his two daughters uh, that were uh, working on the cave and uh, they're down there for the lantern. So it, it, it didn't work. Uh, now, they kept hold of it. Eventually, over the next 15 years, the cave continued to be explored, primarily by Truman Powell. And he would go down into the cave, and he would take all of its caverns and, and go through all the different rooms and the passages. And uh, he would give them names that... If you tour the cave, you know, they tell you what the names of the room are, like the battery room and the blonde throne room and the, you know, the room of doom and Mother Hubbard and all sorts of things named after formations in the caves. So all along, there were people that were exploring the cave. The problem was you couldn't get the Mutton Hollow from anywhere, not easily, not enough to make it a tourist industry. That all changed. In 1905, about the same time that the Shepherd of the Hills novel was being published, the railroad reached Branson from Galena called the White River Railway. They built it as a chain, uh, as a as part of the railroad to get down to Hollister, which was then called Logtown, because Hollister was a town where they did timber production and they would bring the timber to Hollister and hack out railroad ties. There was a big sawmill there. And then they would load it on this new railroad and haul it away for ties, for railroad ties. Well, 
Mr. Ross, old Matt and his wife, Aunt Molly, uh, Georgiana, they decided that they didn't want to live in Mutton Hollow anymore. So they moved over by the railroad, which is what's called in Roark Valley, which is a couple of miles north of present day Branson, and started a little hamlet by the name of Garber. Garber still exists. It's almost like a ghost town. You can see, you can still go to Garber today and you can see it, but it's just, it's almost like a little ghost town north of Branson. And they opened up a general store. They built a uh, railroad depot out of an old boxcar. And people began to come down to Branson on the railroad. And when they found out, people that had read the book, when they found out that the man sitting on the front porch was old Matt and his wife, Aunt Molly, it began to open up a whole new concept of tourism called literary tourism. And so people began to try to come to the Ozarks to meet up with the people that they had read about in the Shepherded Hills and to see the sights. Sammy's Lookout, Inspiration Point, Mutton Hollow, uh, you know, Jim Lane's Cabin, Old Matt's Cabin, all these things. And they still existed. And people were just amazed. And so all of a sudden, you begin to see a movement towards tourism. Of course, this made going to the cave possible. And so over the next 20 years, Lynch would finally, he would build a lodge on top of the cave and he would go to Branson in a wagon and haul people from Branson in his horse and wagon. And uh, they would spend a few days there. Finally, it started working. Uh, he died at the age of 80 in 1928, but his daughters kept the whole thing alive. And for the next 22 years, they would lease, uh, they would operate the cave as a tourist attraction. Finally, in 1950, they would sell the cave to the Hershen family, which, of course, we all know is, you know, if you're from the Ozarks, you know, the Hershens are one that own uh, Silver Dollar City and uh, just a huge tourist attraction. By the way, uh, my mother in law, my wife's mother, somehow had a connection to Genevieve. I don't know how. I wish I, I wish she was still alive so I could talk to her about this. But I can remember going to Silver Dollar City in the early 60s when it had just been built. And we took my wife's, then my girlfriend's mother down to, to visit. She was called Aunt Genevieve I, or Aunt Jenny. I didn't even know who she was at that time. Um, and her house was right on the highway, 76. And from her backyard, you could just walk into the park. And so we went down to visit her. She said, well, you want to go into the city? Just go ahead. Just go through my backyard. I had no idea who I was even talking to at the time. But, uh, and I don't have any idea to this point how in the world my mother-in-law had a connection to Genevieve Lynch. But somehow she did. Somehow there was a connection there, but I just don't know what it was. Uh, so here's an early photograph of some Drury students uh, down in Marble Cave. Uh, they would take field trips from universities and the colleges in the area. And this is a bunch of the uh, people, bunch of college students that they took a picture of. That's how you used to have to get down to the cave. They had a ladder and you had to climb down the ladder to get into the cave. Now, obviously that's, if you've been there, you know it's a lot different now. They have a set of steps and you walk through the cave and then eventually they have a tram that goes that takes you back up to the surface. But it's a lot different than that now. But it's a huge cave. It's third largest cave in America, folks. Uh, Carlsbad Cavern is the largest. Mammoth Cave in Kentucky is the second largest. Marble Cave is the third largest cave in the United States. And so it's a huge tourist attraction. So, as I said, when the railroad came through, it started literary tourism. People who would read the book and want to go see what the book was written about. Now, this, this was a whole new concept in America. It had been around for a while in Europe. Uh, people in England would want to go see uh, Shakespeare's home at Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, 
people over in France who want to go see some of the homes and some of the French writers all just because they wanted to build a connection there. Well, it started happening in America in the late 19th century. Uh, some of the homes like the Louisa May Alcott home at Concord, Massachusetts would still exist. You can still visit. Same thing with Longfellow's Wayside Inn at Sudbury. Uh, Hawthorne's House of the Seven Gables in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, these houses were, that were built and are incorporated into stories and novels of these authors, people wanted to visit them. So they could kind of form a connection. They were so much enthralled with the books. Well, it finally got to the point, remember, Carol Bell Wright's novel was one of the best-selling novels of all time and one of the biggest-selling novels of the early 20th century. People fell in love with this book. And believe it or not, people would travel all over from the United States wanting to go to Mutton Hollow to see where this book was set. They fell in love with it. And all of a sudden, you begin to see people actually making the effort to come to Branson Mutton Hollow so they could see the sites. Like I said, Old Matt's Cabin and Sammy's Lookout and Inspiration Point, Marble Cave, which is mentioned in the book. Um, and like I said, if you were lucky enough, you'd get off the train at Garber and there'd be uh, John Ross and his wife who were Aunt, Uncle Matt, uh, Uncle Matt and Aunt Molly. Uh, you could go to Notch and meet Uncle Ike. He was still, he existed. He was there. He was the postmaster. And you could walk up and visit with Uncle Ike in his post office. Um, you might see Grace Shearer or Susie Morrell riding her horse around Mutton Holler and Branson. So this became a big deal, folks. This is the start of the tourist industry in the Ozarks. So uh, really a, an interesting story there. And of course, there is, again, Harold Bell Wright in his book. He's the, he's the guy that started this whole thing. Uh, you can lay at his footstep as far as the tourist industry. Now, like I said, this was all made possible by the White River Railroad uh, that, that ran through Garber into Branson and Hollister. And like I said, it was there because they wanted to pull logs, pull railroad ties out of Hollister and take them back to Springfield points to build a new railroad. And I told you, John Ross and his family, they saw the future. They knew that this was going to be kind of a deal coming. So they just abandoned their cabin and their mill out in Mutton Hollow and moved over to this new little town of Garber. And he owned a, a house, a general store, the post office, and they lived there for the rest of their life until they died in 1928. They died within months of each other. Uh, so, and it brought about this, this literary tourism that we talked about. And, uh, you know, they'd greet you and they'd have their picture taken and sign their picture if you wanted to pay them a little money, you know. Uh, you know, that's how it all got started. If you were fit enough, you could walk the three or four miles over to Mutton Hollow and see where all this took place. And if you were really strong enough, you'd go a few miles more and uh, crawl down in the marble cave going through the ladder. So that's how this all started. This is a picture of Garber. And uh, that is actually, let me see here. That is Omat. That's John Ross standing there uh, by the edge of the building. And there's the train coming in through Garber. If you ever take the uh, Branson Scenic Railroad uh, back north from Branson, it goes both directions. It goes south in Arkansas, goes north to Reed Springs. Uh, and Glenna, if you ever go north, you'll go through Garber. You know, it actually goes through the old town of Garber, Missouri. So at the same time all this was happening, Power Site Dam was being built. Uh, Power Site Dam is located just a little bit south of Foresight. Uh, at this point in time, Foresight and Taneyville and Kirbyville were the principal towns in Taney County. That would all change when the railroad came through. And then all of a sudden, the population would shift westward to Hollister and Branson. But in the beginning, the population centers were the eastern part of Taney County because that's how the roads from Springfield came. There wasn't really a good road uh, from Springfield to the western part of Taney County. 
there was a fairly decent road to Forsyth on down to Harrison, Arkansas, that came through the eastern part of Taney County. Uh, so a few years after the railroad came through, uh, the electric company uh, that was located out of Joplin, the what became the Empire District Electric Company, and now it's something else. I don't even know what the name of it is now. They sold it a few years back. Uh, they decided to build a dam across the White River. And it became the first concrete dam designed to generate hydroelectricity in the state of Missouri. Uh, the lake that was formed, we now know as Lake Taney Como. By the way, the reason it got its name, I was curious about that and I found out when they were shipping the machinery for the dam, the turbines to create the they would have the big crates, and these were huge crates on the railroad, and they would be labeled Taney, C.O. County, Missouri, M.O., Taney, Co., Mo. And somebody thought that'd be a great name for the lake, so they named it Lake Taney, Como. You know, we're not very ingenious in the Ozarks, you know. We don't, <laughs> uh, it could be Lake Beautiful or anything like that. It'd be Lake Taney, Como. Uh, but that's how it got the name. Um, so they built the dam. And it became, it was a private dam still owned by not Empire, but whoever Empire is now, maybe Liberty, I'm not sure what it is. Um, the lake began to attract attention and fishing docks and uh, villages, kind of resorts began to spring up on the shores. And a group of investors from Kansas City, led by a man by the name of Miriam, decided they were going to build a resort village down by the let down by the dam and they built something called rockaway beach and rockaway beach became the premier resort in the ozarks for decades uh long before branson became the branson of today rockaway beach was the place to go uh it was a beautiful place it had uh just everything you would want uh, it was visited, people, presidents visited there. Uh, the rumor is Al Capone came there several times and visited, you know, because he wanted to get away from the big city of Chicago and the mob wars. And one of the places he came to was Rockaway Beach. Um, of course, we know now that Rockaway Beach is just about as much a ghost town as is Garber. Not quite that bad. Uh, but Rockaway Beach is pretty much uh, gone away. And the reason is very simple. In the 1950s, they built Table Rock Dam. And all of a sudden, the water level and temperature in Lake Tanicomo dropped to 48 degrees. Nobody is going to swim in 48 degree water, not for very long. It just killed Rockaway Beach. I mean, just absolutely killed it. Uh, it hung on for a few years. Uh, I can remember when senior trips used to go to Rockaway Beach. and it was still kind of hanging on in the mid 60s. And then they had a big incident one Fourth of July weekend down there where a bunch of Hell's Angels showed up and it was a big deal. And boy, it just, you know, whatever was left of Rockaway Beach was gone. And there have been attempts to, uh, in modern times to kind of resurrect Rockaway Beach. They tried to build a casino there a few years back, but uh, the people of Taney County shot that down. So, you know, there's been all sorts of different efforts to resurrect Rockaway Beach, but it was a big resort for a long time. There is a power site dam being constructed. Of course, it still exists. You can still go there. And there was Rockaway Beach at its heyday. I mean, it was just a fantastic place. I can remember going there in the mid-50s, and it was on its downhill slide, but it was still a pretty neat place to visit. Uh, they had amusement rides. They had, you know, really nice things going there. Unfortunately, like I said, when the dam lowered the water temperature of the lake, um, it really hurt it because nobody nobody wanted to swim in the, in the lake anymore. And that was one of the big attractions was swimming. So we're into the 1920s now. We got the railroad built. We got power site dam being built. All you needed was people. All you needed was something to get this all going. And it just so happened in the 20s and the 30s, three women, uh, mostly unknown today, and not all the way, but at least two of them are very much unknown, 
had so much to do with, with spurring on the tourist industry, the Ozarks. The first one was a lady by the name of Pearl Spurlock. Uh, Pearl Spurlock was, had come to Branson's. Her name was Sparky. Everybody called her Sparky. And she was a spark plug. Uh, she was just a, you know, one of those people that everybody knew. She came to Branson in 1917 for her husband to run a garage. Uh, to start up, you know, cars were just coming into the area and they needed someone to fix it. And her husband was a mechanic. Well, unfortunately, he got sick. They're, they hadn't hardly moved there and he could no longer do his job. So she decided that she was going to start a taxi cab service. And so what she would do, she would go to Garber or meet up the train at Branson and people would get off of it. And she started a tourist thing. And she said, hey, you want to go see old Matt's cabin or inspiration? And people were just dying to say, oh, yeah. And so she'd haul them up in her Buick taxi cab. And this thing must have been indestructible because she took them over the rocky roads and the glades and cow paths. And she would take them in and she would tell them stories. And uh, she became the first tourist guide of the Ozarks. And people would travel from all over the country to meet up with Sparky. Uh, it said that she loved to drive, she loved people, and she loved the outdoors. It said thousands of people journeying for her over the glades of uh, Dewey Ball and Mutton Hollow listening to her tell stories. Most of them not true, but she told them anyway. Um, and uh, she would just, you know, absolutely set the groundwork for every huckster and every oddball character that lines the streets of Silver Dollar City and Branson. If you've ever been to Branson, you know, they've got some pretty weird people. Uh and uh, they're fun, you know, and so was Sparky. She was fun. And the result was that she's kind of the, the spark plug of the tourist industry, of the touring industry. And there's, I don't have a really good picture of uh, Sparky. That's the only one I've got. But she's standing beside her Buick taxi cab that she had hauled people all over Mutton Hall and all these places to show them all these places that, that Harold L. Wright had written about. So that was the first of the women. Uh, then there was Elizabeth McDaniel. She could not have been any different than Sparky Spurlock. Elizabeth McDaniel was a refined, wealthy, educated lady from Springfield, Missouri. She was a member of the banking family of Springfield. The McDaniel family was one of the, the big families of Springfield in the 19th and early 20th century. Still is a big family in Springfield. And... Uh, she went to Paris and shopped for fashions. Uh, she was she was not a hillbilly in any amount of imagination. But folks, when she picked up the Shepherd of the Hills book and read it, she absolutely fell in love with that book. Uh, I mean, literally, she fell in love with it. She never married. She never had children. She gave up her home in Springfield, moved to Mutton Hollow purchased almost all the landmarks that were in the novel. She had a lot of money and she bought Old Matt's cabin. She actually lived in Old Matt's cabin for 10 years before she finally built herself a new home. Um, she bought his mill. She bought what was called Jim Lane's cabin, which was actually, uh, you know, Matt Shearer's cabin. Uh, she bought the land around Inspiration Point and Sammy's Lookout. She purchased all these areas and she purchased all these landmarks and buildings in an attempt to preserve them. And she did. And I mean, folks, it, had it not been for her, uh, most of these places would have been long gone. You know, we would not have them. But you can still see most of these places. Now, some of them, old, uh, old Matt's cabin, uh, has uh, you know been remodeled quite a bit, but it's there at the outdoor theater. Uh, the uh, Jim Lane's cabin, which was Matt Shearer's cabin, was actually burned, but it was rebuilt. Uncle Ox post office is still there. Uh, the mill that old Matt John Ross built serves as the backdrop for the outdoor theater. If you've ever been to the Separate of the Hills outdoor pageant, it takes place on the, that stage of a sense before you in front of the the audience is old is a uh, john ross's mill the actual one that he built so it's a it's due to her 
that she was able to save these things. And I mean, she absolutely loved uh, what she was doing. And uh, she would meet up with Sparky. Sparky would drive up in her Buick and she'd go out and meet people. And they would have conversations and she would tell the people. And uh, she was quite a character in her own right. It's said that she was a very refined lady. But if you started denigrating the Shepherd of the Hills or you said something negative about that book or something like that, she would absolutely go berserk. She'd start cussing you out. <laughs> uh, she, was, she would not tolerate anybody that would say an unkind word about Harold Will Wright or his book. She absolutely loved that book. Eventually, as she got up in years, uh, she sold all of it to what was called to a group of people called the Trimble family. And of course, it was Mary Trimble and her son, Mark, that got the idea of the outdoor pageant. And they end up building a theater at the homestead. And today you can still go to the Shepherd of the Hills Outdoor Theater. It's not as big as it used to be. Uh, it was a huge attraction in the 50s and 60s and 70s. It's kind of gone down a little bit, but I've been there a couple of times, folks. And it's an absolutely fantastic performance. Uh, the sound system is wonderful. Uh, it's state-of-the-art sound system. I mean, you would think, you know, the sound wouldn't be very good out in the middle of the woods. Actually, it's fantastic. Um, so it's a, it's a really uh, interesting place. And that's how the Shepherd of the Hills Outdoor Theater and the places were preserved through the efforts of Elizabeth McDaniel, Lizzie, as she called herself. And this is old Matt's cabin that she lived in. She lived there for 10 years before she built herself another home. Um, so it's quite a story. Now, the third woman that is involved with tourist industry in the Ozark is pretty well known, and that's Rose O'Neill. Rose O'Neill was a famous person in the late 19th, early 20th century in America. Uh, she was an illustrator, uh, a cartoonist, and her illustrations was in every major magazine in the world. And I mean, she was a wealthy person, folks. She had homes in New York City. She had a home in Paris. She had a home in the Caribbean. But for some reason, her father had ended up in north of Branson, a little town called Walnut Shade. And he had built him a house there, 170 acre estate. And I mean, she loved it. She called it Bonnie Brook. And she absolutely called, this was home to her. And when she wanted to get away from the hubbub of the big life, the Paris, New York City, the Mediterranean, she would come back to the Ozarks and find seclusion. Arcadia, like we talked about earlier, she would find seclusion at Bonnybrook. And so that was her refuge or place of solace. It's here at Bonnybrook that she created the Cupies. Uh, if you know anything about Rose O'Neill, you know she's the, she was the creator of the Cupid dolls and all. And folks, this was gigantic in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th century. Cupid dolls were all the rage. Um, and I mean, they just made her a wealthy person and a very famous person. She built this 14-room Victorian estate there. She had it landscaped. Um, she absolutely, um, you know, loved this place. Of course, uh, as things turned out, uh, with the Great Depression, uh, she began to uh, lose money, and uh, her wealth ran out, not totally, but began to run out, and she moved full-time to Bonnybrook and lived there for about the last uh, 15, hmm, um, by the last 15 years of her life or so. Uh, she finally sold uh, Bonnie Brook uh, when she died. And not too long after the Bonnie Brook died, uh, it ended up burning down. The estate did, the building, the house. Uh, a group of people got together, artists, fans, and rebuilt it. And you can go today and see Bonnie Brook. It's the reconstructed house is still there as a tourist attraction. Uh, and she brought a lot of people to the Ozarks. This is Rose O'Neill. 
And that, of course, is her Cupid doll collection, one of her cartoons. And that is the original Bonnie Brook. The uh, replica had been built just basically as an exact replica of the original Bonnie Brook house. By the way, if you if you like Cupid dolls and if you're interested in Cupies, if it's something that just thrills you, um, she left most of her estate, Cupid dolls and drawings and things like this, to the College of the Ozarks, and it's in the Ralph Foster Museum. So uh, it's something if you're really interested in that, you know, this is a part of what's in the museum at the College of the Ozark is her Cupid uh, collection. So that was the three women, folks. These three women had so much to do with saving the heritage of the Ozarks and making it open to the public. Now, it was still to the point that about the only way you could get to the Ozarks was by the train. I mean, I'm telling you, if you want to get to the Ozarks by car, it was, you were taking your life in your own hand. I mean, you, it was, it was a tough way to come. Well, thankfully, that began to change in the 60s <clears throat> because there was a movement, pardon me, in the 20s, there was a movement to pull Missouri out of the mud and to create an interstate highway system. And so they began to have a convention where they were going to build highways across the country, concrete highways that would take you from all parts of the nation and, uh, you know, paved roads uh, just so you could see wonders like the Grand Canyon and the Painted Desert and the Petrified Forest. So in 1925, uh, they had a joint commission set up and it was discussing how in the world to build this highways and and doing the plan and the routes and everything like this. And they had finally reached a pretty much of a decision about how to do this. Uh, the main Southwestern route was going to run from Chicago to Long Beach, California, and it was going to run right through Springfield, Missouri. Uh, it was going to be called Route 60. Well, the problem was Kentucky was bypassed, and they were upset. And so they were a big part of the commission and they started boycotting this thing and causing all sorts of trouble. And they said, uh, until you put a highway system through Kentucky, an interstate highway system, we're not going to vote for this. We're going to kill it. Uh, so finally, they decided they reached a compromise. The compromise was reached at the Kentwood Arms Hotel in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, pardon me, the Colonial Hotel. They were having a big meeting of this railroad, of this uh, highway commission. And they finally reached a decision where they would name it Route 60 through Kentucky and Southern Missouri. And the main route from Chicago to Long Beach <clears throat> would be labeled Route 66. That's how Route 66 got its number. And that's how uh, it got to be good, built with that number. As a result, Springfield now claims itself as the birthplace of Route 66. And of course, they have a big festival now every year. Here's the actual telegram. That is John Woodruff, one of the movers and shakers of Springfield that was very instrumental in this. Pardon me. <clears throat> Voice was getting a little dry. Um, he was one of the big movers and shakers in all of this. And uh, he was one of them that, that reached this compromise to rename this highway, this interstate highway across the southwestern part of the United States as Route 66. And that's why Springfield claims itself as the birthplace of Route 66. And like I said, now they have a huge festival every year in the summer uh, to celebrate it. It's a big deal. Um, so there's old Route 66. Still exists. You can go through it. Uh, goes from Springfield, most of it to Carthage. And uh, I'm sure some names have traveled over Route 66. Uh, there's one of the uh, restored um, service stations that's there. Uh, that's right near the little town of Halltown, west of Springfield. I've been there a couple of times. It's an interesting thing. People will come from all over the world to travel Route 66. I've been down this road lots of times because it's not too far from where I live. And uh, I guarantee you, I hardly ever go down this road down and see somebody in a Corvette. 
because <laughs> you might remember the the uh, you know television show Route 66, where they travel all over the country on Route 66 in a Corvette, and <clears throat> people rent Corvettes and travel Route 66 just to be part of it, mainly from Europe. It's a big Europe thing, and there's Red's Hamburg. Uh, it was an old hamburger joint on what's now Chestnut Traffic Way, um, and it was a Big deal. Supposedly, Red's Hamburg was the first drive-through window. Guy had a uh, he had this old restaurant there, and he thought it'd be a neat idea to cut a hole through his wall, and you could drive up right next to it, and he'd take your order. I'll bet you some of you have eaten at Red's Hamburg. Don, I bet you Red eat at Red's Hamburg. Uh, by the way, the reason they had to call it Red's Hamburg instead of Red's Hamburger. They built the sign, didn't realize how tall it was, and they couldn't get it down the highway because of the line, so they had to cut the bottom two feet off. <laughs> uh, all sorts of stories. Well, finally, one more last thing, and we're going to done. Uh, we all know that Springfield, or uh, the Ozarks, is a big fishing, big uh, area. Um, this all started back in the 20s and 30s with a man by the name of Jim Owens. Jim Owens came into the Branson area in the 1930s and lived there for the rest of his life and started a big fishing guide service. And again, he was one of these kind of people that just never met a stranger. I mean, you know, uh, Jim Owens was one of these people who was just bigger than life, kind of like Sparky Spurlock and Elizabeth McDaniel. He just, you know, uh, he could absolutely separate you from your money without a blink of an eye, you know. And, uh, Jim was a huge force in Branson. He was a he owned a bank, he owned a, a restaurant, he owned a movie theater. I mean, I mean, he was a, a big name in Branson for about 50 years. I can remember Jim Owens. I, I'm old enough to remember seeing him. He because he didn't die until the early 70s. And uh, people would come into the Ozarks and he would give them a fish. He started fishing guide service and would take you down the White River for days, float service. And this is where the float trips in the Ozarks began. And uh, he got written up in magazines like Life and Look and Outdoor Life and Sports of Field. And just, again, people would just give him another reason to come to the Ozarks. Um, and, of course, we all know now that White River is dammed up. But Table Rock's a different kind of fishing than it was under Jim Owens, but it's still a big fishing attraction. Um, there is Jim Owens sitting in one of his John boats with his pipe. Uh, there's Jim in front of his theater, downtown Branson, which still stands. The Orange Theater is still there. Uh, it's kind of like a little theater now. Uh, it was a movie theater when I was going to call it to call it the Ozarks. We go down there on Saturday night and see movies, you know. Uh, but this is, uh, that's Jim Owen standing there and that's him sitting in his, uh, one of his John boats. So, modern era tourism. We all know Table Rock Lake was built in the 1950s, uh, destroyed a Rockaway Beach, but built a huge fishing industry at Table Rock Lake. The Hersons move in, they built Silver Dollar City atop the cave entrance, and that thing now hosts two to three million people a year coming in, one of the premier uh, amusement parks in the United States. Uh, the Trimble family, as we mentioned, purchased the Shepherd of the Hills homestead and uh, made the outdoor pageant theater there, which is still going and still an integral part of that. And finally, of course, uh, in the 1960s, we started seeing all these music theaters build up, all started with the bald knobbers. Uh, the uh, Mabe family uh, started a music theater down in Old Roller Rink in downtown Branson and eventually built a new theater out on Highway 76. I remember when that theater was built and people thought he was crazy. They said, why were you doing building a theater out in the middle of nowhere? Well, he was pretty smart because he brought it down there. And of course, now if you've been to Branson, I like to call it a country fried Las Vegas. You have to, you know, it's, uh, I, I was, I was amazed to find out there are more theaters on 76 country Boulevard than there are on Broadway. I didn't realize that. Uh, until I started doing the research. So that's it. That's how the tourist industry got started in the Ozarks, uh, particularly the Shepherd of the Hills country. So next week, we're going to talk about the Great Depression.
Uh, we're going to talk about how the Great Depression came about, how people uh, survived. Um, and I'm sure out there, some of you probably have much better experience about this than I do. But that's what we're going to talk about is the uh, Great Depression and how it affected the people in the Ozarks. So hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, hope you stay tuned next week and we'll learn a little bit more. Hey, Tony, Very interesting. we took a seniors to Silver Dollar City back in the 60s. Yes. Now, and I was in, in, I graduated from high school in 1958 and my choral club went on a little tour and we stayed the night at, at uh, oh, the one you, Rockaway Beach. Rockaway Beach. Rockaway Beach.